it put together by nobody else but the winner of uh, this year's uh, Spine uh, Trivia Night, and it's uh, the Great Texas Back Institute. And Dr. Satin is going to host uh, and lead the discussions. He selected great articles, so we're looking forward to a insightful session. Good morning, Alex. Good morning, Texas. Wonderful. Thank you, Dr. Chapman. Uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Alex Satin. I'm a spine surgeon here at Texas Back Institute. Um, you know, it's a very exciting uh, time of the year where our uh, fellows from last year have graduated and moved on to practice and uh, welcoming our uh, new fellows who are fantastic and uh, get a chance to meet today. Um, so kind of in light of that, um, you know, the, the theme of today are, you know, uh, or is going to be that, uh, you know, five studies that every spine fellow should know. And certainly these are not the only five studies uh, that they should know, um, but we'll, uh, you know, keep with, uh, in the theme of, you know, building a knowledge base during their year of fellowship. And um, these are really five landmark articles that will uh, help them uh, throughout their year. Um, our first fellow is going to be uh, Dr. Uh, Michael Markowitz, um, and he's going to be discussing uh, abnormal mag magnetic resonance scans of the lumbar spine in asymptomatic individuals. So go ahead, Mike. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, nice to meet you. As Dr. Satin said, my name is Mike Markowitz. I'm going to be presenting this article by Dr. Bowden out of JBJS uh, titled Abnormal Magnetic Resonance Scans of the Lumbar Spine in Asymptomatic Subjects, a Prospective Investigation. So in the past, studies have evaluated the use of CAT scan, CT myelogram, and even discography to assess the lumbar spine in asymptomatic patients. However, prior to this study in 1990, uh, the utility in the MRI had not been similarly evaluated. While we know now MRI is extremely sensitive to detect soft tissue pathologies, uh, disc herniations, spinal stenosis, the question here is, is it specific enough when the, abnormal the abnormality is seen in the absence of symptoms? So the purpose of this study was to determine the prevalence of positive findings on MRI of the lumbar spine in asymptomatic subjects. So here they looked at 67 asymptomatic volunteers who underwent 1.5 Tesla MRI from L1 to S1. The ages ranged from 20 to 80 years, uh, approximately 50-50 male to female, and the subjects were recruited through local newspaper advertisements and even their spouses were included um, when applicable. They were uh, evaluated through standardized questionnaires to include no history of back pain, um, if the patient reported any history, even up to 24 hours of back pain or necessitated time off of work, they were excluded from the study. Uh, overall, 100 patients were presented to three blinded neuroradiologists for review, the 67 asymptomatic subjects um, from the study, and then 33 symptomatic patients proven clinically and on imaging. Um, the pathology at each level was well-defined by the neuroradiologists by importance, severity, and certainty, where substantial pathology was herniated disc or spinal stenosis, or just any pathology as bulging disc or degeneration of a disc. Um, each level was scored quantitatively and objectively, and then tabulated according to the subject's age. Uh, what they found was that substantial pathology existed in 28% of these patients, where 24% of that composed of herniated disc and then 4% of spinal stenosis. Uh, the prevalence was equivocal between males and females and the percentage of subjects who had abnormal, abnormal findings did vary by age. Um, as you can see here, the younger cohorts, 20 to 39 and 40 to 59 year olds, about 22% of the time demonstrated some abnormal finding where the 60 to 80 year olds, about 57% of the time um, had something abnormal on their scans. Again, this correlated mostly with herniated discs um, in the younger cohorts being about 22% of the time, and then 36% of the time in those 60 to 80, followed next by spinal stenosis. Um, what they saw was the herniated discs were most prevalent in the L5-S1, about 50% of the time, and then closely followed by L4-L5. Um, here we're looking at the percentage of findings in at least one disc level. Um, they noted about 54% of the time, those under 60, had some form of bulging disc. And then when we look at the higher and lower uh, cohorts here, 34% of the patients in the 20 to 39 demonstrated some form of degeneration. And as the patients aged, it went to all but one in the 60 to 80% or 60 to 80 year olds being 93% of the patients having some form of degeneration. Um, those under 60 actually averaged about two disc levels uh, demonstrating some pathology and those 60 to 80, about three levels. Um, what they noted was that herniation and 
herniation correlated or did not correlate well with bulging discs um, varying by age, but bulging discs did correlate with degeneration as the patients aged. Um, in the study, they speculated that there may be other causes of bulging rather than just degeneration, or that the MRI itself might not be as sensitive to picking up those subtle changes initially. Um, overall, there was about 335 asymptomatic discs reviewed by the neuroradiologists who agreed 90% of the time that pathology did exist, and two of the three of them actually agreed 99% of the time. The variation in the severity of the pathology, not necessarily that it exists or what it was. So overall, a significant number of asymptomatic patients undergoing advanced imaging will have some reportable abnormality. Uh, these results while present, should be considered with caution, as many of these findings are actually age-dependent. And the younger patients with significant findings are more likely to be indicative of a true complaint. Um, I do think one of the limitations here is that the subjects that they collected, we weren't given any demographic um, occupation or activity level, so this may skew kind of the small population that we're looking at here. But I think the real take-home point is that operative decision-making should correlate to specific clinical findings, which are confirmed by diagnostic imaging. And where this applies definitely in practice is when we look at patients we're about to operate on, uh, correlate clinically to imaging, and oftentimes we notice adjacent levels do have disease, um, the question becomes how much surgery does a patient really need or should have? Thank you. Thanks, Mike. Um, yeah, uh, great job. You know, I think um, that is a paper that uh, I often will quote with patients and, you know, even in that 20 to 39 uh, cohort, you know, over 50% of those patients have bulging discs. And so we'll, we'll not infrequently, you know, see people in the office who, um, you know, uh, had some acute back pain or even more chronic symptoms who then get an MRI that was ordered elsewhere. And, you know, they, they think, you know, I have all these, bul I have 10 bulging discs in my back. And, you know, I think that it, it's something that I you know, don't necessarily quote directly uh, with patients in the office, but I will frequently uh, allude to um, and, and kind of, you know, let them know that just because it's a radiographic abnormality may not necessarily be causing their symptoms. <clears throat> Any thoughts, Peter? Sorry, I just literally uh, put you on the hot seat. I, I logged on 10 seconds ago. Alex, if I can just step in for, uh, for Peter comment, I, I think the lesson is as tempting as it is to look at an MRI scan before you see the patient, um, you tend to then get a preconceived notion. It's always better to go talk to the patient first and then come out and see if uh, it, the MRI scan agrees with your clinical um, thoughts, your clinical diagnosis or your, your clinical perceptions. Um, so try to resist uh, looking at the MRI scan first um, and then going in the room. And it's hard to do, especially when you're seeing a lot of patients quickly, um, try to get into the habit of getting the history. And whenever things are confusing, I always come back to the mantra of when all else fails, talk to the patient. Yeah, it's usually steer a, you back on the right track. That, that's a great point. And we uh, actually spoke about that this morning with the fellows at lecture um, uh, this morning, you know, about, and, and, you know, I'm totally guilty of it too. You'll, you'll take a look at the scan and uh, be convinced that the patient's going to need surgery. And then you spend time with them and examine them. And you realize very quickly that, uh, you know, despite the uh, imaging that they're not necessarily a, a surgical candidate at this time. This was the, the paper that was just presented. Sorry, I didn't have the link. Was the one about the asymptomatic patients getting MRI? Yeah, the, the Bowdoin uh, MR, lumbar yeah, MRI. I mean, I think this is important. This is why spine surgery is interesting, is every patient's a puzzle, and, and you're trying to filter the signal from the noise. And, and obviously, just because there's problems there, you, you would expect patients to have abnormalities on the MRI. And, and what makes our job interesting is trying to parse out what's really relevant and what's not. This is a great first paper. Um, whoever chose that, um, I concur uh, with uh, Peter and the group. Um, the one question I have is, in Texas, um, do the radiologists routinely put a suffix, <clears throat> a disclaimer, into their reads that quotes the Jarvik study that says, watch out for overreads. Uh, here in Seattle, uh, in Washington, that's a routine thing and it uh, doesn't help at all. The patients still focus on uh, the abnormalities identified, but is that a, a national standard? Is that something that happens in Texas? I, I've never seen that actually. I've not seen it either. Okay. 
Yeah, our, our radiologists routinely in the state of Washington uh, put in the Jarvik study, which has a similar focus. It's a local radiologist, and uh, despite that, uh, uh, the psychological, the detrimental psychological effect on alarming patients uh, is profound. So uh, this is very, very important that we keep that in mind. And I completely concur. The fascination of spine part is that mismatch. I see a mismatch on the screen here. A mismatch of imaging findings and what does the patient actually look like? And it never gets old. Question, uh, did they have, um, did uh, Scott Bowden and his group look at modic changes in back pain? Uh, they didn't talk about it in this paper. No. That would have been, obviously, since they already went through that endeavor, a substantial uh, additional contribution because many of us try to divine back pain from uh, modic changes, yes or no, and it remains unclear what that actually means and what its relationship to back pain is. But thank you for that fantastic study. Yeah, great job. Thank you. You want to get ahead? Uh, go ahead, uh, OJ. Yeah, absolutely. Just swap right in here. Uh, so the next article uh, is an article from the European Spine Journal in 2015, and a uh, little bit of a different bent. Basically, just looking at the mismatch between pelvic parameters, pelvic incidence, and lumbar lordosis uh, predisposing to adjacent segment disease after lumbar spinal fusion. And this has obviously been a very important topic uh, in the literature in the last five or 10 years. Just a brief introduction, adjacent segment disease uh, frequently is poorly defined radiographically, meaning there isn't always a consistent definition across the literature as to what comprises adjacent segment disease and at what point in time you could classify it that way versus clinical. Uh, generally speaking, in most studies, uh, the consideration is radiographic uh, more so than clinical. And the prevalence varies within the literature for symptomatic uh, adjacent segment disease. And as you can see here, the numbers are significantly wide depending upon when you pick that up. And that can be a result of surveillance imaging versus clinical symptoms dictating um, the obtaining of that image, just as we discussed a moment ago. Risk factors are poorly delineated, uh, more so that we can identify many risk factors, but there isn't one that specifically we can point to uh, some of the ones that have been identified include pre-existing facet degeneration, generation, increased post-operative disc height, uh, lower post-operative lordotic angle. These are all risk factors that were cited within the introduction of the paper as ones that were circulating within the literature but have not been well elucidated. Spinal pelvic parameters really are what changed this in providing a further understanding of the role of economy of standing or the supposed cone of economy and work by um, some of the European surgeons looking at upright posture and pelvic parameter analysis. And there was thought to be some relationship between pelvic incidence and lumbar lordosis. And most of those had come out of maladaption or iatrogenic mismatch that had been seen in the literature. So this study uh, was a retrospective review of their patient population with different indications, uh, including inclusion criteria and exclusion criteria. Of course, the inclusion criteria included uh, degenerative lumbar spondylosis or spondylolisthesis, patients that have leg pain or claudication, so not just purely back pain. Um, exclusion criteria, these patients had to have complete preoperative documentation, include plain upright films as well as an MRI. They had to um, have not had prior spine surgery, or sorry, they, they had to have had prior surgery, or surgery other, and they had to demonstrate a lumbar deformity, uh, not to demonstrate a lumbar deformity, my apologies, either degenerative scoliosis or an ismic spondylolisthesis, uh, which would exclude them from this. The control group had a minimum follow-up of five years. They had no signs of symptomatic adjacent segment disease. Again, that's important as compared to radiographic. And they had similar levels of fusion with a comparable degree of disc degeneration in, uh, in this prospective segment. All the patients um, did have standing lumbar radiographs, as I mentioned, but they were not long segment films in order to assess global spinal balance. All patients underwent a roughly similar surgical technique with posterior lateral instrumented fusion with pedicle screws. They demonstrated radiographic union during follow-up. Um, I'd already mentioned about prior spine surgery and they showed up, they did not show a lumbar deformity as mentioned. Uh, cohort matching, uh, each of the cohorts was matched in terms of the grading of preoperative disc degeneration and that's via the Furman grading. Other preoperative considerations, this is just looking at the demographics of each of the different study populations, the adjacent segment disease and control groups are relatively well matched within their follow-up and other uh, demographics listed on the left. You can see the preoperative Furman grades in table three on the right, 
for which there was a similar distribution of disk desiccation at each of these levels. And then you can also see in table two, the levels and number of segments that were fused between the two groups. Figure one demonstrates how pelvic parameters were measured within the context of this study. And that's important so as to elucidate that lumbar lordosis was measured from the L1 to L5 um, end plate levels. Uh, sacral slope and PI and, and PT were all measured in standard fashion. Uh, statistical techniques, without uh, belaboring the point, essentially a uh, logistic regression was used with our statistics package. Uh, and uh, each of the, the groups, with the exception of the ones listed in the third point, non had a normal distribution. For the results, the radiographic measurements are listed here between ASD and controls. Uh, there are a couple um, points in particular which are important to note. Uh, these include the lumbar lordotic. Uh, angles uh, L1 to S1 between adjacent segment disease formers and the control group that did not have some symptomatic adjacent segment disease. Um, the pelvic incidence uh, amongst these groups, as you can see, they're relatively well matched within the uh, pelvic incidence and in control groups. And then uh, the remainder of these provide some additional context, but I think it's really a summary that's more important. Within the adjacent segment disease, uh, higher pelvic incidence was found to be significant as compared to the control group. They had a higher pelvic tilt, though this was non-significant, higher sacral slope. They did also have a significant lower lumbar lordosis. So therefore the delta between that higher pelvic incidence and lower lumbar lordosis proved to be greater, which is the uh, ultimate takeaway that there was a odds ratio of about 10.6, meaning a patient was 10 times more likely to develop adjacent segment disease if they had a mismatch greater than 9.8 or for round purposes, 10 degrees between their pelvic incidence and lumbar lordosis. And that's where the idea of a 10 degree um, match between pelvic incidence and lumbar lordosis being the goal for the surgeon, at least radiographically, was birthed. Um, in terms of post-operative considerations, these were uh, some additional points within the discussion, looking at two types of spines that resulted from the instrumented fusions. You can see on the left, type A in which there's a smaller mismatch and type B within which there's a greater mismatch. Uh, the important points to note here is you can see the uh, type A group has a well-preserved lumbar lordotic curve with their normal pelvic incidence and a relatively small pelvic tilt. Within type B, you can see that the lumbar lordosis is slightly more flat. The pelvic incidence remains the same as that's a morphologic parameter, but the patient attempts to compensate via increasing their pelvic tilt. And this is an add-on that's been found over time is to aim for a pelvic tilt of less than 25 degrees in an attempt to maintain a balanced uh, lumbar spine. So the takeaway messages from this study really uh, try to dictate when surgeons are looking at, um, at providing a correction or even providing single level or, or two level lumbar fusions, that it's very important to consider the regional and global balance of the spine, that the should be to mitigate the amount of pelvic incidence lumbar lordotic. It's important, of course, to have a sense of that going into surgery being via upright x-rays, whether that be uh, lumbar films, as was mentioned here, or a, uh, a global image, either via long cassette films or an EOS. Uh, there are references within these studies uh, to global sagittal balance. That's what was ultimately built on this, uh, which is now the primary objective within the surgical management of adult deformity, in addition to PIL mismatch, looking at SVAs and trying to maintain that uh, as an economical standpoint. And there's a further relationship when considering correction of different subtypes of the spine, including receiving subtypes. And there was intending within residents, you always told me, if you're not thinking about deformity, you will create additional deformity. And I think that that's what this study illustrates so nicely. Thanks, OJ. Great job. You know, I think that your final point um, kind of uh, hits the nail on the head in that, you know, even if you're not necessarily a deformity surgeon, um, it's imperative to consider uh, the patient's, uh, you know, lumbar lordosis, overall sagittal alignment, um, as well as their pelvic parameters to ensure that you're setting themselves, you know, you're setting the patient and yourself up uh, for success uh, long term. Um, you know, interestingly, um, 
uh, who does everybody get uh, EO, EOS x-rays or Scully films on, on their patients would be interested um, to hear, I, you know, I, I will often do it, but I don't do it on everyone uh, who's having a lumbar fusion. Um, but it'd be interested to hear what uh, some of the other people around the country are doing. Well, Alex, you know that I've been doing that uh, forever and ever and ever. Uh, just to get back to a little history that the hip spine syndrome was first described by Ian McNabb out of Toronto. Uh, many, many years ago. Uh, so I was sort of brought up on looking at the whole axis. And I think it's even more relevant today than it was then because we're doing so much more. Absolutely. Uh, Phil Louise on. Uh, Phil, uh, do you normally get uh, EOS x-rays for lumbar fusions or what, what's your approach? I mean, I'd love to, but we just don't have access to an EOS machine here. Yeah. But I love this topic because, you know, and I love that last line because right, I, I think the goals of surgery for a long time were just decompression and then stability. But now we're having to bring in the consideration of this whole sagittal alignment as well. The one thing I find difficult too, and, and you know, we tell our fellow this all the time, is that in a deformity setting where a lot of this data was brought out, you have a greater ability to make that correction if you see you know, a, a mismatch that needs to be improved in a one or two or even three level degen setting. It can be a lot harder <laughs> to try to bridge that gap if you have a large PIMLL mismatch, especially with like single level pathology. Oftentimes you see just more focal kyphosis as the degenerative sort of process worsens and the sort of adjacent levels start compensating and become hyperlordotic. But when you correct that single or, or two level pathology, those adjacent levels sort of return to neutral a little bit too and can sort of reduce the amount of uh, sagittal alignment correction that you're obtaining because you're just operating on a couple levels. But I do think it's important to think about sort of in the entire process. Yeah, that's a great point regarding the adjacent levels. It'll, I'm always interested to see after doing a 4-5 or L4 to S1 fusion, you know, you can see what that adjacent level that was previously hyperlordotic has return to normal. You know, the, the thing about the, these parameters is interesting is, you know, we treat them as like a static, you know, uh, uh, number and measurement at a single point in time, but we know that the goals of alignment change as people get older. And so, you know, particularly by doing the fusion, you kind of lock them into that alignment that may be good for a 45, 55 year old, but may not necessarily be appropriate when you're 75 or 85. And so that's kind of where I always find this to be um, uh, a little bit more difficult um, to, to kind of uh, make sure that, you know, is this gonna be the right answer for the patient forever or for now? So, so Alex, at, at the risk of being overly repetitive and maybe even a little redundant, uh, I do think, and I've mentioned this many, many times before, we have to get away from this concept of age-specific alignment and move to function specific alignment. Those that are up standing and walking need a different lumbar lordosis than those that are sitting all day long. So that's what we really need to, to look at is function specific alignment. And, and this is where the gate lab data that, that we're generating is really helping us determine what are those function specific alignment parameters people really need. Alex, this is a good place for a shameless plug for arthroplasty, where we don't have to dial in and lock in a specific alignment. We can let the patient's spine align itself. And, and with that, I'll stop. No, that's a great I point. set you up well, didn't I, Jack? Yes, you did. Thanks, Izzy. You know, I've done a, a kind of like preliminary dive into that. And, you know, there is some written about changes in sagittal alignment about arthroplasty, but I think that we've kind of only scratched the surface with that. <clears throat> Great, I think we can, um, in the interest of time, uh, we'll move on to the uh, next article, which will be uh, presented by our fellow Dean Perfetti. Good morning, everyone. Um, Today I'll be presenting this article, A New Classification of Thoracolumbar Injuries, The Importance of Injury Morphology, The Integrity of the Posterior Ligamentous Complex, and Neurologic Status. It's published in Spine in 2005. Uh, Alexander Vaccaro and Jefferson faculty were the lead authors on this paper. 
But for background, at least in 2005 and prior to that, there were thoracolumbar trauma classification systems that were mostly descriptive and not predictive. Some of the limitations were either they were too complex, like the AO classification of madrils. There was a failure to include anatomic physiologic factors. And lastly, they were not suggestive of treatment. So the authors felt that an ideal system, an ideal classification system, that is, would provide universal language and a clinical guide. So the objective was to devise a practical classification system for thoracolumbar injuries, assisting in clinical decision-making in terms of the need for operative versus non-operative care and surgical treatment and approach in unstable injury patterns. A literature review was conducted on thoracolumbar trauma classification and treatment. This paper ultimately included 40 surgical spine experts from 15 level one trauma centers globally. The constraints that they unanimously decide on were the following six. One, that a new classification would provide a description of major morphometric features. Two, that there would be an analysis of injury severity. Three, mechanical and neurologic aspects of injury would be included. Four, would be that it's reproducible. Five, usefulness in prospective research settings. And lastly, six, flexibility to evolve through future clinical studies. They then went on to conduct validation surveys and to apply their new classification system to a number of cases. So the first of the three subcategories subcategories was morphology, specifically the fracture pattern. So similar to the AO classification system, it usually matches with the mechanism, but again, it's not equivalent. And the three types that they broke it down into were compression, translation, distraction. So with compression fractures, uh, vertebral body fails under an axial load. This was given one point when you have an anterior wall buckling. When you have the posterior cortex involved, that was given two points. And the injury could be a flexion compression, a flexion burst, with or without distraction of the posterior elements. The second category now being a distraction or trans, uh, excuse me, a translational injury. Uh, Torsional and shear forces causing the rostral part of the spine to translate or rotate with respect to the caudal portion more destructive and unstable. There's horizontal separation of the spinous processes or altered pedicle alignment above and below the injury and a unilateral or a bilateral facet dislocation will qualify. Now this last uh, morphology distraction being four points is when the rostral component of the spine is disconnected from the caudal component. The spinal column is disrupted circumferentially and this could be an extension or a flexion injury combined with compression or a burst. The next component uh, that they came up with was the integrity of the posterior ligamentous complex. And we know that the PLC is composed of the supraspinous ligament, the interspinous ligament, the ligamentum flavum, and the facet joint capsules. And it protects the spine against excessive flexion, rotation, translation, and distraction. So injury typically is indicated by the splaying of the spinous processes, diastasis of facet joints, or facet perch or subluxation. Zero points were given for an intact PLC If it was suspected but indeterminate, mostly on MRI, that was two points. And then if it was obviously involved, it would be three points. And the last category is neurologic status, which is an indicator of the severity of uh, the neurologic injury. So zero points, obviously, if you're intact. If a nerve root's involved, that's two points. If it was a quarter conus injury that was complete, it would be two points. Incomplete would be three points, as well as with cauda equina, three points. So the injury severity score is composed of these three subgroups, morphology, neurologic condition, and the PLC integrity. And zero to three points was given a conservative treatment algorithm. Four was a borderline. You could go either by conservative or surgical, and five to 10 uh, would be surgical. Next thing the authors went on to discuss was surgical approach. And they felt that the two most important considerations was neurologic status and the integrity of the posterior ligamentous complex. And they go on to talk about an incomplete neurologic injury with neural compression from anterior spinal elements should be uh, require an anterior approach, while a posterior ligamentous complex disruption generally requires a posterior procedure. And if you have combined incomplete neurologic injuries and PLC disruption, generally a combined approach. They also discuss qualifiers and these influence operative versus uh, conservative management. So these qualifiers can be local in nature, whether there's extreme kyphosis or collapse, open fractures, overlying burns, and inability to brace, 
There could be remote comorbidities that influence your decision-making, head trauma or other uh, system trauma. And the systemic considerations, how's the bone quality? Does the patient have osteoporosis, uh, arthrit rheumatoid arthritis or obesity? So in their discussion section, they go on to discuss the validity and reliability. And the two common systems at that time, the AO and the dentist classification, we know with the AO, it provided categories for all injury patterns, and it led to high complexity, though, and impracticality, while the Denny classification uh, really simplified fracture classification and led to many patterns not being recognized. So some of the limitations of this current system, um, the TLIX that ultimately emerged from this, was questions about reliability and reproducibility of evaluating the posterior ligament disintegrity on MRI, which was poor. The sensitivity approached 100%, but when you talk about the specificity of an MRI for the PLC, uh, it was 50 to 80% based on other papers. I quoted one from Ryan et al. in the Journal of Neurosurgery uh, when comparing radiologists and spine surgeons looking at these MRIs. There's also discrepancy in morphology classification and specifically translation and rotation. You can see the CAPA statistic there was 0.36 for inter. Uh, inter-observer uh, reliability, and distraction was also difficult for many of uh, the spine surgeons across, uh, across the board. There was also a lack of relevant clinical patient-specific modifiers that were included in this version, which was subsequently updated, uh, but osteoporosis and inflammatory diseases really isn't part of the injury severity score at this, in this paper. And lastly, um, a lot of the critics have said that uh, the TLEX does not reflect global surgical preferences. For example, in North America, a, a burst fracture may be treated most likely conservatively, while in Europe, uh, you may get a 360 fusion, uh, at least quoted in this paper, and, and things may have changed over time. But in conclusion, ultimately, the TLEX was designed to depict features important in predicting spinal stability, future deformity, and progressive neurologic compromise to facilitate appropriate treatment recommendations. It may improve communication between spine trauma physicians and education residents and fellows. And in operative candidates, features of the PLC and the neurologic status serve to direct the optimal approach. Uh, in conclusion, however, no treatment algorithm should supersede surgeon intuition. Thank you. <clears throat> nice job, Dean. <clears throat> Thank you. Is uh, Ted Bellinger on by any chance? Yes, sir interested to hear your thoughts about this uh, classification and, you know, how, uh, whether or not this is something that you, you utilize in your practice. Yeah, so uh, um, for, for anybody in the audience doesn't know me, I take a, a call at a level one trauma center, do a lot of trauma. Uh, and first of all, shout out to Izzy and the other uh, co-authors on this uh, study. I believe he was at least part of the study group. Um, Anyway, I think this is just like any classification system, a nice starting point and in terms of your thinking about when should I operate or not operate, but nothing is perfect and, and each patient is individualized treatment and all that. Uh, but it really is a pretty good framework to start from in turn, and it helps you kind of organize your thoughts uh, about what are the priority issues and making these decisions. So, so I don't, I don't uh, calculate the TLIC score on every thoracolumbar fracture that I see formally or document that in any way, but I'm in one way or another, all of this thought process goes through my head when I'm, I'm trying to decide how to manage an individual patient. Awesome, thank you. Yeah, I think that was part of the reason why I chose this article was, you know, to get the uh, fellows to start thinking about, um, you know, the morphology, what should they necessarily be looking for, um, and, you know, evaluating in regards to <clears throat> what is relevant in determining whether or not someone needs surgery. And I think that, you know, what's nice about this classification, and while it's not perfect, um, you know, I, and I know that you kind of go through in your own head as to what structures are intact versus not intact. Um, and but if you're not Ted Bellinger, this is a, a great way um, to to kind of organize that and, and give you a reproducible approach to these injuries. <clears throat> Phil, do you uh, utilize this? 
I like to use it as a framework. I think that, that's just like Ted just said, I, I think it's really important to, to see the patient and the ligamentous complex uh, disruption and the neurologic status have a huge role in, in the decision making. Um, oftentimes, I think we see um, you know, fractures that may have been operative or unstable in the previous uh, classification systems. And I think this TLX score does a really good job of at least separating that out, but I don't calculate it either, um, nor do I see a whole bunch of high level trauma anymore. But it is nice to have a framework to think about and to sort of base your decision on. Yeah, I completely agree. Um, great points, everybody. So this is Jens Chapman. So uh, one of the key things, first of all, great uh, to have a trauma uh, paper in your five essentials. So kudos to you for selecting that. The second thing is uh, there's a classic misconception that the Denise classification is simple. It's actually not simple. It's an extremely sophisticated thing. And one of the biggest misdeeds it did, however, was introduce the uh, concept of a non-existent middle column. And it pervades the present date, just like Harrington rods in the radiologist's eyes. Uh, in the general, general nomenclature, but Francis Denise, to his credit, did a very sophisticated balance job, and sadly, he's misremembered for the middle column, the non-existent middle column in his legacy, but it's not a simple classification system. Um, I concur with the others. The, the TLIC score was not a classification. It's a severity scale, so that's a substantial difference, and it just uh, helps us kind of validate or see indications for surgery, which when we looked at that with AO a little bit more in greater detail, we saw that our German-speaking um, uh, colleagues really chose to overrate uh, injury severity and uh, treat them very aggressively with surgery, one of those interesting cultural insights. Uh, but the main point of these systems is always to have a mental check list like what uh, Dr. Louis just said and to go through that and be sure that you assess that and along those lines one of the, my main clinical exam points that is frequently missed is posterior tenderness. All of us were taught I think to roll patients and palpate them from cranium through coccyx and document gaps, document ecchymoses, uh, document uh, any form of pain reproduction that is focal. And that is so critical when we assess a PLC to not uh, have to over rely on the hypersensitive MRI scan. So the same theme as with the lumbar MRI study that you just presented. Uh, the physical exam points uh, very specifically towards the importance of un understanding the patient in an integrated fashion and palpating the patient and documenting that is key and so often misses in the in uh, assessment. So thanks for that article. Yeah, great, great points uh, for the fellows, Dr. Chapman. You know, I think the other thing to think about are your polytrauma patients because um, there's definitely different consideration there. So um, you know, obviously with everything, uh, you know, that's just one component, but, um, you know, to Dr. Chapman's point, examining the patient and then kind of considering their overall kind of disease burden um, in a trauma setting is, is really important. But uh, we'll move forward with the next article. Um, Dr. Salar uh, will be uh, presenting uh, this uh, landmark paper by Dr. Hillebrand. Thank you, Darcy. And again, I'm presenting another JPJS article titled Radicalopathy and Myelopathy as Segments Adjacent to the Site of a Previous Trace Cervical Orthodesis, again, it's by Dr. Hillebrand and, uh, um, and, and his uh, colleagues. It came out of uh, Case Western uh, in Cleveland and published in 1999. The primary endpoint of this paper was to determine the incidence and prevalence of symptomatic adjacent segment disease in a large, in a large population during the first 10 years after an ACDF. And also to assess whether multi-level fusion was a risk factor for this pathology and determine whether any arthritic changes at levels adjacent to the orthodesis sites are related to the late development of neuroradiculopathy or myelopathy. Uh, the design of this study essentially was done in two parts. The first part, they looked at patients between 1973 and 1992. They had uh, 374 patients that met their, uh, their inclusion criteria and a total of 409 ACDF done uh, by a single surgeon. Um, equally kind of equal, but relatively equal between male and female, average age was 51 and the range of 17 to 83. The surgery was indicated after a failure of an operative trial, and none of these patients had any uh, traumatic presentation, did not have any neoplastic process, or were scheduled to have a secondary posterior procedure. Um, of the 409 uh, ACDFs, 284 were indicated for strictly radiculopathy, 103 were for myelopathy, and the remaining were a combination of these two uh, presentation. 168 were single level, 131 were two levels, 37 had three levels, and two had four level procedures, and the remaining had a subtotal vertrotomy, uh, 21 single level, 
uh, 28 two levels and 21 had three levels and the last two had two levels. The patient physical exam was uh, done by details and preoperatively and postoperatively by the same primary surgeon. And uh, periodic x-rays that include flexion and extension were done uh, with each follow-up up to the fusion encounter. So the second part, then uh, those 409 procedures were reviewed independently by another spine surgeon for diagnosis of symptomatic adjacent segment disease. And the diagnosis was made when a uh, presence of any uh, neurodicular or myopathic symptoms, preferable to an adjacent uh, level on two consecutive visits. The symptoms first uh, were managed inoperatively. And if the symptoms did not resolve or the patient had myelopathic presentation, then advanced imaging were obtained. Uh, the outcome of non-operative or operative treatment were, uh, uh, were essentially categorized based on the uh, um, Robinson criteria which basically looked at pain medication activity and work status and divided into uh, uh, excellent, good, fair, poor outcome. So for the primary output results, the first thing they found for the most part that uh, uh, the new disease developed by relatively constant rate uh, in the 10 years following the index surgery, which is, uh, came up to an incidence of average of 2.9%. Uh, and the overall prevalence was 11.7% at five years, 19.2% at 10 years. However, when they did, when they accounted for uh, patients were lost to follow up using the Kaplan Meyer survivorship analysis, they predicted that um, uh, the, the risk of uh, the prevalence of uh, adjacent segment disease was actually higher. So 13.11, 13.11, 13.6% uh, uh, compared to 11.7% at five years and 25.5% compared to the 19.2 at 10 years. So um, when they, uh, you know, the, the number apparently jumped higher when they accounted for patient loss for follow-up. They also found that uh, there are significant differences on the previous, uh, among the various uh, motion segments regarding the relative risk of development of this uh, pathology. And uh, the highest risk was for the C5, C6, and C6 segment, a segment because it was the relative risk for development of the pathology was almost five times higher when you compare it, for example, to the C2, C3, and C7, T1, and T1, T2, which is basically a lower screw, and the C3, C4, C4, or C5 were intermediate in between, uh, in between kind of uh, risk uh, for development of this, this uh, pathology. Um, the new disease typically developed immediately on an immediately contiguous level, either cephalad or caudat, to the side of previous uh, orthodesis, or both. Secondarily, also look at uh, risk of symptomatic adjacent segment disease when uh, the patient had multiple uh, level fused. And uh, contrary to their initial hypothesis, it turns out that the prevalence of uh, the development of this uh, problem was only 12% within with the multi-level uh, multi orthodesis group and was actually 18% in the single level of procedure. So kind of, again, uh, that was uh, a surprising factor because it was initially thought that multi-level was a risk factor for this presentation. Uh, lastly, they evaluated uh, pre -op, all the available preoperative imaging uh, for the adjacent segments of the planned index effusion. And uh, they found that 18 patients had no evidence of uh, adjacent, segment, adjacent uh, uh, segment disease on uh, preoperative imaging, and that was grade one. And then 18 patients had a grade two, so relatively more advanced uh, chain, radiographic changes. Uh, then 12 had grade three and two had severe degenerative changes on the preoperative imaging. The reason why this was important because the average time for the onset of symptoms was more than seven years and the patient who had grade one versus the patient who had uh, grade four, the onset of symptoms occurred in less than two years after the fusion uh, surgery. So I kind of summarize on this slide, the uh, you know, take home points from this paper is again, uh, First of all, steady incidence of disease at 2.9% per year in the first 10 years. The prevalence of the disease was 19.2% at 10, 10 uh, years, but when you account for the patient who lost the follow up, it jumps to 25.6. And then the symptomatic adjacent segment disease, who uh, also was most common at the C5, C6, and C6, 7. And uh, multi level orthodesis is not a risk factor for the development of this problem. Cervical motion segment with greater range of motion had higher prevalence of adjacent segment disease and patient who had pre-existing degenerative changes had more of a, a rapid onset of uh, symptomatic adjacent segment disease, which may be related to advanced age. In conclusion, I mean, it's, it's kind of important to know our patients and do a detailed physical exam with a correlated analysis of uh, available imaging. Uh, patient who have a clinical disease affecting multiple levels should not be managed with a single level procedure. 
patient uh, should be informed that there's approximately one in four chance of new disease development at another level in the first uh, 10 years after the ACDF. And lastly, this paper kind of opened the door to uh, consideration for motion preserving implants uh, when indicated for the right patient. And that's it. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, great job. Yeah, I mean, this is just one of the classic papers in orthopedics and spine surgery. And I think that um, it's, it's really valuable because, uh, you know, patients um, in this day and age are just really uh, knowledgeable and ask a lot of uh, questions uh, with surgery, you know, and I think as arthroplasty is becoming more prominent, um, you know, uh, some patients actually need to have a fusion and, but they're, uh, you know, they've read online and, you know, they have all these questions and, you know, this paper really kind of gives us some uh, information that we can reliably quote um, to our patients and uh, help guide them uh, as to what to expect in the long term. Alex, if I can just add a caveat, um, we have, we're lucky we have several Henry Bowman uh, fellows at Texas Back. Sure. Um, as the senior one of them, my fellowship was right in the middle of that 20 year collection period. So I can tell you that 100% of the patients at, up to that point got uh, autographed and no internal fixation. So they got very different constructs than we're using sure. today. Um, so it'd be interesting to uh, kind of update this, um, uh, this type of study with more modern constructs to see whether we've done better or worse in uh, transferring load to adjacent segments. That's a great idea. Um, yeah, I, for sure. It's, uh, it's, things have definitely changed um, in that regard. Um, it, it would be interesting to, to see if, if with modern constructs, uh, that was either the same, better or worse. I'm not so sure that it may not be worse. I find it I find it great to look at these old articles that we thought we knew inherently inside out uh, years later. And it's always amazing to me how there's so many hidden details and other aspects in there, such as the disease severity that, uh, that was identified here. I totally forgot about so I, I really appreciate you selecting this. It's obviously a no-brainer, great point. Uh, to Dr. Ziegler's point, one of the biggest problems is, and this, way, this is where we go back to the first article selected, is how well did we restore lordosis? Um, and how well do we understand the patient's underlying pathologies, such as inflammatory disease, uh, or collagen instability, or things like that? And finally, the Dan Rue aspect of uh, did we violate, or are we getting close to adjacent segment with our hardware? So there are multiple variables in there, but this is obviously a major landmark understanding of how uh, we create an artificial and bad environment for adjacent segments. So thank you for selecting this. Absolutely. And uh, the final uh, article will be uh, presented uh, by Joel, our fellow, um, and uh, he's just getting everything ready. Go ahead. Uh, can you hear me fine? Yep, we can hear you. <clears throat> Good morning, everybody. I'm Joel Joma. I'll be presenting um, the early versus delayed decompression for traumatic cervical spinal cord injury. Results of the surgical timing and acute spinal cord injury study, also known as um, STASIS. This was published in 2012 by Fellings and Vicaro and Associates. So jumping into the introduction, um, <clears throat> during this time frame, uh, it was reported that the traumatic spinal cord injury accounted for 750 injuries worldwide per million. The existing laboratory evidence supports the theory that decompressive surgery of a spinal cord injury attenuates the secondary mechanism and improves the neurological outcomes. Um, though that being the case, the optimal timing of the indicated operative intervention was not solidified in literature. Those studies were starting to trend towards early intervention being the modality of choice. The objective of this study was to compare the relative effectiveness of early, which was less than 24 hours post-injury versus late 24 hours or greater post-injury surgery with respect to the neurological outcome six months post cervical spinal cord injury. They hypothesized that undergoing timely surgery post-injury will experience less neural tissue destruction, improved clinical outcomes as compared to injury match patients with uh, surgery delay. <clears throat> In regards to their methods, this is a prospective multi-centered cord study involving six hospitals ranging all the way from Canada to Kansas City. Enrollment was between August 2002 to September 2009. 
Um, appropriate radiographs were obtained. Uh, the clinical assessment, in particular, the age of impairment scale grade was assessed within 24 hours of admission of the patient. Then they subsequently went into inclusion exclusion um, uh, for establishment of being the study participant. In the top right, you can see the chart for um, their inclusion exclusion criteria. Exclusion criteria is being cognitive impairment preventing accurate neurological assessment, penetrating injuries to the neck, pregnant females, pre-injury, major neurological deficits, disease, life-threatening injuries that prevented early decompression of the spinal cord, arrival at the healthcare center greater than 24 hours after spinal cord injury, surgery greater than seven days after spinal cord injury, and then you have your inclusion criteria. And this is pretty important because it plays a role um, in, in their outcomes. So methods uh, in continuing, there was a few different things that played a role into the timing of the decompression. One, time elapsed post-injury, to the time required to obtain their diagnostic in, uh, investigations, and as well as the, the discretion uh, for the timing of surgery was dictated by the attending spinal surgeon. Intervention approach, either anterior or posterior, and the levels of intervention was surgeon dictated. In all cases, decompression was accompanied by the instrumented, instrumented fusion, and the steroids were um, used uh, per the discretion of the, treatment team, of the treating team. Their outcome measure in the study was their primary outcome measure is ornal change in their um, age impairment scale grade at six months follow up. And then their secondary uh, outcome measure was the inpatient postoperative complications. So, statistics um, they use logistic regressions, um, student T tests for continuum variables, and then you have your chi squared and your Fisher exact for categorical data. So, jumping into the meat of the study, so there's 313 study participants, which were divided into two different cohorts. So, in the early cohort, which is, I mentioned is less than uh, 24 hours, they start off with 182 patients due to loss of follow up, 47 uh, to loss of follow up, and um, four deaths <clears throat> that, led, 100, that led, to led to them having 131 patients. Um, same thing in the late group. They start off with 131 patients, 39 were lost at follow-up, and there's one death leaving 91 patients. So the end amount of patients in both groups were used for the primary outcome. Uh, the uh, initial amount of patients, the 182 in the early and the 131 in the late, were used for the secondary outcome. In regards to demographics, there's no significant difference in the demographics except for age. And as there were younger patients in the early cohort group and not statistically significant, in regards to the injury, most injuries causing the spinal cord injury were uh, attributed to MVCs and falls. Um, in regards to the Asia impairment scale grade, uh, they were worse in the early group, um, having more A's and B's uh, versus in the late group, which had uh, more C's and D's, and that was statistically significant as well. In regards to the intervention, so the average time in the early cohort group was 14 hours, and the late group was 48 hours. Steroid was uh, using 62% of the patients. However, there was a high predominance of usage in the early group. And no patient in either group underwent repeat operations for inadequate decompression. Now, looking at their primary outcome, uh, which was the Asia uh, impairment scale grade at six months follow-up. So in the early cohort, there's no improvement in 56 um, patients. So that's 42% uh, proportion. One great improvement in 48 patients, two great improvement in 22 in pa patients, uh, three great improvement in four, and then one great regression in one. In the late group, there's no improvement in 46, one great improvement in 37, two great improvement in eight, and no regressions. The, the, they premised the um, threshold of significant neurological recovery based off of preclinical uh, research, which was uh, seen in the SIGEN trial, which is a, a major therapeutic a uh, trial uh, that looked into uh, spinal cord injury, and they deduced that in that trial, that a significant neurological recovery as at least a two-grade Asian impairment scale improvement at six months uh, uh, was significant. Looking at the in table six, um, in the study, they did a logistic regression, which accounted for the preoperative neurological status, um, which was worse in the early group, as well as steroid administration, which was higher in the early group. And adjusted for that and found that um, in the in the um, that it, they had a 2.8 percent or 2.8 chance higher in odds uh, in the uh, of having a two or more greater age impairment uh, scale grade improvement in the early versus late uh, surgery and that was statistically significant. There was also noted to you know have a, at least a one. Um, 
uh, one uh, greater odds in uh, uh, having at least a one grade Asian perma scale uh, improvement, uh, but that was not statistically significant. In regards to secondary outcomes, uh, which were their inpatient complications, there was 97, four indi 44 individuals experienced 48 complications in the late group, 40 individuals experienced 49 complications. Uh, the majority of the complications in both cohorts were cardiopulmonary in nature, uh, but the difference in, between the two courts was not statistically significant. In regards to mortality, uh, this was divided uh, in between you know, less than 30 days and greater than 30 days. Uh, so in less than 30 days postoperatively, there was one post-op MI um, um, mortality, and in the late group, there was one pulmonary complication leading to mortality. And greater than 30 days, uh, in the early group, there was three cardiopulmonary mortalities uh, that were noted and no, none in the late group. So conclusion uh, with an adjusted and unadjusted analysis showing uh, that early operative decompression leads to a significant improvement of the neurological status, which is defined as at least a two grade age of impairment scale at six months followed after cervical spinal cord injury. Some limitations of my thoughts on this study. So as they discussed, you know, the there was a noted um, surgeon interventional bias. Um, the early group were younger and they had worse uh, AIS uh, grades, um, but that was supplemented and accounted for with their multivariate regression. In regards to loss of follow up, so um, they did in both cohorts have significant amount of patients that were lost of follow up, but that is the nature that you know we do see in trauma um, research, um, specifically in ortho trauma and research, not just in, in what they what they have shown in this paper. Um, and in regards to the study design, that's one of the things that I liked about this paper. Um, they really, you know, they, they specify that yes, you know, better studies at this time point when this was written need to be, um, formulated so that we can delineate, you know, is early, you know, the best answer, but they also went into detail on why that's not the, why that's easier said than done. Um, for example, having two patients who, who possibly have jumped the sets or whatever the case may be who are both medically able to go to or medically clear to go uh, for surgical intervention and then you know trying to achieve that gold standard which would be you know our prospective randomized control trial i mean are you really going to wait past um you know a certain time point to, to take this patient who's in front of you you know deteriorating uh neurologically so um but I do think there's ways to, to compensate for that, or at least to boost the study. I mean, take into account the fact that, you know, it's a trauma study and a lot of people will likely be lost to follow up, maybe bolstering that in, in regards to your collection of participants. So um, that leads me to um, how would this study affect my practice? I mean, um, I, I, I think it further, you know, double downs on the point that, you know, if a, your patient is medically clear, you want to get to them sooner rather than later. Um, you, you know, I, I think you have to be uh, wise in the fact, just like with all research, you know, you want to make sure that um, when you're using the study to either, you know, uh, discuss with your patients going forward or their families um, about when they ask what, what may happen to, you know, what, what the outcome will look like, you need to make sure that that patient matches um, what is seen in the study. For example, they had a, a good amount of uh, exclusion criteria, and I think that also bolstered their results in the end. And then they do go into detail about that as well. So I think, you know, it's a good paper. Um, it's a good foundation. Um, just when you're using that, make sure that your, your patient population that you see clinically matches, you know, what, what is shown in this paper. Thank you. Great job. Thank you so much. Um, excellent points. Um, uh, you know, very interesting study that obviously took, you know, tremendous effort to put together and uh, study a very difficult patient population. Um, you know, it's interesting um, in that, you know, the high dose steroids were given, which is not really the standard of practice anymore, but, um, you know, still very valuable um, and help justify uh, early operative intervention for patients that are suitable. The key flaw in the study, and I thank you for putting that in, was um, uh, the lack of identification of central cords in one group versus the other. When you have central cords that are prevalent in one group versus the other, uh, you'll sway your results, and this is a heavy confounder in this uh, differential analysis. So this 
uh, had led to a lot of internal discussions. The main strength is that uh, the concept of early surgical decompression for a cord has finally changed away from the 72 hours, which for some reasons historically prevailed, and it's clearly not early. And um, we need to try to really push towards the next uh, level, which is uh, getting to a decompression within eight hours in a, a high quality fashion. So I look to the young generation represented by yourself and colleagues to kind of push towards the eight hour reduction and not the 24 hour margin. Thanks. Thank you so much. Um, yeah, that's a great point and something that I was actually thinking about when you know rereading this article of, uh, you know, kind of where do we go from here? And uh, that, that's, I'm glad you brought that up. Um, I think we're pretty much out of time. Um, great job uh, to, you know, thank you to our fellows. You, you all did a wonderful job presenting. And thank you to uh, Seattle Science Foundation for inviting us and hope everybody has a, a good weekend. Alex, Thanks, Alex. Thank you.